Absolute Power, Founding Fathers, and Building a Great City. It's the history of Louisville on Spirit Inspire, starting right now. Broadcasting from the Cathedral of the Assumption in Louisville, Kentucky, this is Spirit Inspire. And now, here is your host. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Spirit Inspire. Today, I'm your host, John Soule. Joined with me is my co-host, Eric Huff. Hey, John. Hey, Eric. And uh, Isaac couldn't be with us today. Uh, today, we're talking about a story. And it's not just any story. It's an incredible, exciting story of our own beloved Archdiocese of Louisville. And to do that, uh, we have our great historian, non-historian, Eric Huff. He's going to kind of lay the groundwork for how our archdiocese came to be and uh, how we uh, hope to be one day. Because there are two fundamental questions, I think, that we as human beings need to learn how to both ask and answer consistently throughout our life in deeper ways, right? And those questions are, where do I come from? And where am I headed? In fact, these two fundamental questions are irreplaceable. And this is what the Catechism tells us, that we have to know where we came from and where we're headed if we want to know who we are and why we matter. And I think to do that within our own individual lives, within our families and, and marriages is valuable within our own humanity, but also within our community, our city, our archdiocese, yeah. and our church. So, uh, uh, Eric, uh, start us off. What kinds of ideas and uh, things do you have to share with us as we kind of begin this new year uh, into uh, the uh, by first going back into the history books? Sure. So, uh, like John said, um, it's going to be a history. I would hope it's a series of videos yeah. on really our history here in the Archdiocese of Louisville at the Cathedral of the Assumption. But I really wanted to take today, uh, you know, that, that's a long history. Where do you start? At, right. at, in, in the, the beginning, beginning. Genesis, right? Yeah, Genesis 1-1, <laughs> one, one, uh, God creates the heavens and the earth. Okay, um, right. That's the first and foremost portion. Well, maybe we should just start reading yeah. the book. No, yeah. <laughs> we're not going to do that So <laughs> uh, I, I, might, I might have you uh, crack a Bible here in a second. But uh, before we get to that, I, I do want to say, um, you know, there's, there's so many places we could start with the history here. Do we start with the Catholic Church in America? Do we start with the founding of the country? And, and since we were, we're, we're being so specific um, to Louisville, uh, a lot of places start with the Diocese of Bardstown. Uh, I'm sure some people might be familiar a little bit with that history. And we will get into that in maybe a future video. Um, but I, I thought we would start with uh, Louisville as a city first. Um, as kind of a good place to start. So we're here in Louisville, Kentucky. The Cathedral of the Assumption is the Cathedral of Louisville. Right. Um, so when we talk about Louisville uh, and, and it's kind of start where, it, where it comes from, the foundations of this city, uh, I kind of want to talk about the foundations of any city, of, of foundations of cities and their history. So um, the most famous city I can think of is the Eternal City in Rome uh, and its history. So, uh, what do you know about the founding of Rome? Well, I uh, I know the basics of the Romulus and Remus, and I can't remember a whole lot uh, to it. But there was, I mean, something to do with they were the fact that they were twin brothers, twin right? brothers, yeah, and that they were trying to. Uh, uh, build a city of some sort. I might be wrong. I'm so, not sure. But that's about as far as I go. And then there's this, this odd relation to Harry Potter because of something to do with Romulus and Remus, okay. Lupin. I don't even know okay. that I remember from childhood, right? It's been a long time. Um, but those, uh, and then Romulus, I think, is the, 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 the root of the word Rome itself right yeah. something yeah. like that but that's about all i know so so in the founding of that city and in that mythology uh, right and how that came about is that that there was romulus and uh and also his brother remus they were uh they were raised by a a she-wolf um and and what does that really speak to you know that's that's a mythology I don't think that they actually, you know, suckled on the breast of a wolf or she ra she raised them. <laughs> right. But it, it's kind of speaking to the people of Rome that, you know, they're tough people. Like yeah. they could have, they might as well have been raised by wolves. Um, so Romulus and Remus um, get into a fight. And uh, Romulus 
kills Remus and names the city Rome after himself. Um, oh, so he wow. kills his brother. And there's another version of the story, I think, where Remus kills Romulus and names it after him. Um, but in any case, it's Rome, not Reem. So, right, uh, so I feel like it's... So, so yeah. yeah, Romulus <laughs> kills Remus and, uh, and names the city after himself. Um, which, you know, in the Bible... Uh, what does that make you think of? In sacred scripture, there's another uh, story. Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Right. So um, so what happens in that story? You, I know you're a great Genesis scholar. Oh, yeah, I love Genesis. So, you know, Cain and Abel are the parents, or the, the children of Adam and Eve, right? And because they were, after the fall, they have to then make sacrifices to God. And yeah. Cain only chooses to sacrifice the bare minimum, the, the leftovers of his vegetative fruit of his labor, gardening. And then Abel sacrificed his very best, right? His first fruits, the, the best lamb he had to offer. Yeah. And Cain, because of his bare minimum attitude, God did not find favor with either his fruit or it, with, with either his sacrifice or with Cain and his attitude because it was about his heart. And because of that, he gets jealous of Abel, lures him into the field, and brutally murders him. So we go from biting of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil of the tree to murder pretty quickly from Adam and Eve's fall to the fall of yeah. Cain uh, and the curse. So similarly, he, he murders his brother. Right. And uh, do, you, do you know any other parallels? Can you think of another parallel between that story and Romulus and Remus? Um, uh, Jacob and Esau. But not in the sense of killing each other, but in the the uh, the, the, the deception, the rivalry, the brother the anger, re relationship, uh, the sure. broken rupture. Well, I, I think specifically with Cain and Abel. Sure. Is there anything oh, I, I can't remember. Do you have? Yeah, I have, I've got yeah, something. Please, it's a loaded. Me. It's a loaded. I'm question. excited. Right, I figured. So, uh, I figured you had the answer. <laughs> so what's crazy? Uh, what's a crazy parallel between Cain and Abel and Romulus and Remus is that. Um, in the story of Cain and Abel, we read in Genesis 4, 17, um, that Cain, after he's, he's, he's killed his brother, Abel the just, um, you know, he, he has a family. He starts a family, uh, and he has a son, Enoch. But what's, what's more important, I think you know that, right? Enoch's the son. Yes. Uh, that's right. You can, you can source me on that one. Right. Uh, Cain kills Abel and has a son, Enoch. Enoch, right. And in 4, 17, he starts a city he founds a city mm. Cain founds a city and names it after his son Enoch the city itself is called Enoch wow so we know we know Romulus and Remus <laughs> that Romulus <laughs> founds a city after he kills his brother right. but I never remembered from scripture um that that Cain, Cain that. also founds a city wow and uh so those are the two those are two very early examples in the history of the world of the founding of a city and they both involve um, killing, the killing of their brother right. before they found the city. And uh, St. Augustine notes that, and he's the one who points out that parallel. And his point that he makes, that St. Augustine makes, is that every city, whether it's a biblical city, the, it's probably the oldest city that we hear about being built in the entire Bible, um, whether it's a city from Scripture or you know the greatest secular city, ever created, the eternal city in Rome, right. um, no matter what the city is uh, that man builds, that it is always built on a betrayal, on the blood of brothers. So um, as humans, we- It's we, pretty dark yeah, to start there. <laughs> we always need to recognize on any history of any city that, that it is built um, to some degree because humans are fallen. Uh, even early humans, even, you know, right after the first parents, that since we're fallen, that there's going to be um, those elements to the foundations of any city, however great it is, however remarkable, however a blessing it is to the world. Um, the only city, um, St. Augustine tells us, that is not founded on blood and betrayal is, is the city that God builds, which is founded on love. Mm. So uh, we have to keep, as Christians, there's a lot of hope there. But when we get into the history of Louisville, um, not that it's built on bones and blood and betrayal, um, but there is some of that. There's darker elements to it. I do want to point out, you know, that no city is perfect, that no city, is, except for the city that God makes, is built on 
which is built on love, no other city is like that. Only God who is perfect can create a city that is perfect. Well, there's there's a uh, old church hymn that I've uh, grew up listening to, and it was always, let us build the city of God, right? And when I went to a, uh, a course at the Theology of the Body Institute, one of our instructors was saying something that kind of uh, untwisted that. Because when you think of building the city of God, yeah. what I think, the tendency is with us as human beings, because we think of industry and efficiency and pr productivity, is there's this um, cutthroat mentality with with business. You know, you got to cut the make the deal no matter what, no matter who you step on on the way there. And so when you're building something, oftentimes you do neglect people, betray people, even kill people. Right? I mean, sure. think of the mafia. But when our when our uh, instructor was saying this, he said, you know, it's not, you can't really build the kingdom of God because God doesn't need us at all. In fact, he only builds the kingdom with living stones, human beings who have received the word so thoroughly into their body, into their being, that they literally become another Christ. Yeah. And so in this way, you're not building the kingdom of God. The real lyric should have been, let us reveal the kingdom of God that has always been and always will be. And when you give people that sense, it steps us outside of time, outside of the historical brokenness that we always seem to fixate on yeah. and into the light, onto the things that don't shy away from the conflict or the controversy, but know how to address that sinfulness of our humanity in order to untwist it, redeem it, and then move forward with hope. Yeah, yeah. That's and that's the city that we're looking for. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, so uh, back to Louisville, I guess. Is, is Well, that's what I was saying, right. It, yeah. it has to do with our city as well. Because Absolutely. Because it's not just about this theoretical city that only exists in our minds right. and our hearts. How do we see our own city of Louisville with all its issues and politics and problems with that lens of love, with that lens of sacrificial, passionate awareness of how we are called to encounter one another, not betray one another. And this is where I, I think it's powerful to realize that even though Cain and Abel had that, those issues and it seemed irreconcilable, over time in their genealogy, there was reconciliation in different ways between brothers. So right. Jacob and Esau had those you know, painful betrayals as well, but they found reconciliation in the end. Yeah. Joseph and his brothers, his brothers sold Joseph into slavery, right. and yet they had reconciliation. You know, and that's all Genesis. And then you can track it throughout the rest of the story of scripture, even past scripture at the establishment of the church with Jesus and the apostles. Yeah that led us to the Vatican and now today uh, in our own present day, how was our archdiocese built, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah, and, and that gives us great hope, or at least gives me great hope um, for us here in Louisville that, you know, wh whatever the issues may be, whatever the problems we may face in the future, however terrible certain circumstances it might seem, that there is a great hope and a great hope for reconciliation. Um, so here in Louisville, um, you know, we sit on, like, like Rome sits on the Tiber as, as the major uh, river, we have the Ohio River. Yeah. So I, I kind of want to get into uh, some kind of ancient history, I guess. So, uh, you know, I, I grew up in Cincinnati and near us was Fort Ancient and we heard about this cultures and uh, Serpent Mound. I don't know if you've ever been there. Yeah. Oh, well, I've not been there. I've heard a lot about it. It's so it. cool. Yeah. Oh my so, gosh. So there's been people um, along the Ohio River for an extremely long time. Um, I, I don't know. The Ohio is really special to me. Uh, the river is. Um, I grew up with my papa who would, uh, he would call it the Salawithapi. I do not know what, Engl what wait, language wait, wait, that's wait, wait, in. Salawithapi? Salawithapi. Wow. Is the name of the river. What's that I, mean? I don't know what tribe. He said beautiful river. Hmm. I don't know what tribe. Uh, maybe maybe a spirit inspired fan can help us out. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how to spell it, so I can't Google it. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Salawithapi, the beautiful hmm. river. And he would always recite poetry about the Ohio River. And we would spend a lot of time uh, out on the Ohio. Um, 
there's this place called uh, Conrad Giles Park we would drive out to from Covington, Kentucky. Um, Rabbit Hash, Kentucky. Have you ever been there? Uh-uh. It's, uh, it's a little town. Uh, it got... It just has one corner store, and eventually, like, what had where it came from is that uh, pirates on the Ohio had burnt down whatever settlement was there, and all they left was a sign that said Rabbit Hash. What? From the rest of the signs, and nobody knows what it means. It's called <laughs> Rabbit Hash. Uh, it's like a, a little general store is all that's really in the town. It's a cool place to, to go spend a, a trip to and, yeah. and get a moon pie and sarsaparilla. Just hang out on the river. <laughs> they elected uh, a, the a dog, the mayor of Rabbit Hash. So what? it was like the only town in uh, <laughs> maybe the world that had a dog for a mayor. And they've continually elected another dog as mayor since. So you can go there. So it's just a gimmick. You can at go this there. Point, you can go be. there and, and meet the mayor. <laughs> pet the mayor. Pet the mayor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, give the mayor a treat. That's so funny. Um, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, so I've got a lot of great memories. And then my mamma was from uh, a small town called Rome, Ohio, on the Ohio River. Um, and all the, all the locals call it Stout. Hmm. Like, I guess that was the person who first surveyed it or, yeah, or whatever. Sure. But uh, Rome, Ohio, she grew up in Owl Holler in uh, Rome, Ohio, and, and actually had a great uncle who, uh, who served in World War II, uh, Menford Rivers, and uh, he was from Rome, Ohio, and he was at the Battle of Anzio. Wow. Um, and he died liberating Rome, Italy. Uh, and he's buried there in, in Rome, Ohio. So uh, it's kind of one of our, our great heroes in our family. That's cool. So, uh, so I love the Ohio River. Uh, grew up around it. I grew up near it uh, in Cincinnati. Yeah. Um, just, just a really special place for me is, is the entirety of the river. From, a, from its start in Pittsburgh... Um, all, the all the way to the end in Cairo, yeah. yeah. I grew up in Louisville, as yeah. you know, and uh, I've always had that connection to the Ohio River as well. And, and you think of any city that's going to be prosperous and strong, it's going to be built next to some very important body of water. Yeah. And uh, for me, it was all, you know, you, you got... It, it's a beautiful view, first off, not just the city skyline, but just to see the the nature of creation and i remember when i was a cub scout i think i was in we went to a field trip or something up to the falls of the ohio yeah yeah and, oh yeah uh, we got to like get trilobites i can't remember i think that's what they're named or something like that and uh, the little fossils yeah the different okay. fossils and i remember going up there and, and seeing it and uh, getting to play a little bit in the in the shore of the river and stuff. And uh, a few years ago, my dad got his uh, old fishing boat out with me and my brother. And he took us up to Harrods Creek, which is up near Prospect. Yeah. And uh, we had to put in right there on River Road across from Thurman Hutchins Park. And so we were actually on the Ohio River in a tiny fishing boat. And I I guess it was really windy that day, but man, it was terrifying. We're like, this boat breaks for any reason. What's going to happen? And we were thinking about that poor kid who, who lost his life yeah, on the kayak yeah. and, and all of that and the intensity of that. But but once we got to Harrods Creek, it was a lot quieter and peaceful. But uh, but just the spending time with family, I think, is is part of you know the beauty of the river and, and uh, the value of allowing something that uh, consistent and stable to give us life and to refresh us. You know, I, I think of the walking bridge, you know, and yeah. how wonderful and attractive that place is for so many, you know, to yeah. not just exercise, but to just be, you know, spending time there is a, is a valuable part of, uh, I think, understanding our own humanity and uh, our own families. So it, it's always been meaningful to me. The Ohio River is beautiful. Yeah, and uh, I, I mean, even uh, I'm just reflecting uh, just two days ago over this past weekend, um, I went up to Steubenville, and uh, man, that's another Ohio, great Ohio River town. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and... I didn't uh, think about yeah, that. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, what a great place that is. And, and you were speaking about the bridge. Like, there's this really sketchy bridge in Steubenville <laughs> really? that looks really old, it doesn't, it looks like one lane, but there's two lanes of traffic going across it. Um, it's one of those, like, I call them humming bridges where there's like those metal grates. Like if you look down, you can oh, see down yeah, in the water right, right. and it is long and it's zzz, all the way across. I had to cross it before I left Stephen though. <laughs> um, 
J- just Ooh. to say I did it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's excellent. Um, and then you're saying you're talking about this, and it's like these cities that are connected by the Ohio then can have some spiritual connection too, because you know there's there's also the this there's a spiritual reality to rivers. Uh, I I heard a song once that it really changed my life, and it was a guy named Peter Mayer, and he called it "God Is a River." Yeah, and he was what I was learning is that it was kind of talking about the passion uh, of our humanity. We're oftentimes afraid of, scared of, because it's you know can get us into trouble if sure. we misdirect it. Sure. And so oftentimes we as human beings would rather just be on a rock of safety, a rock to hold me fast. And we call that God. And yeah. there's truth in the structure and stability that God brings us. But when the wild raging rapids kind of take us away, uh, he actually says later in the song, and this river's like my body now, carrying me along. And it doesn't mean just go with the flow and do whatever feels good. You know, it's not that. It's more like recognize that there are legitimate uh, desires and longings of the human heart for stability and peace. Um, But to get there, you have to traverse the treacherous waters of difficulty and pain, suffering, uh, confusion, so that you can make sense of whatever you've been through in order to have that stability. And to me, that changed my life. And the Ohio River is wild and raging and terrifying and yet powerful and beautiful and worth spending time at. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of beautiful places, too. Um, Just thinking, I was in Madison, Indiana not that long ago. And if you come in from the Kentucky side and you see Madison from the top of that hill across the river, I can't think of, like, a more picture picturesque place than Madison, Indiana, uh, as we, you know, uh, in the winter time, yeah. coming down this uh, this really steep uh, hill, and it just sitting in the river valley below. Uh, it's a really special place. Um, yeah, so you know, there's a lot of big cities on uh, on the Ohio River. Uh, Cincinnati, my yeah. hometown, being right. one. Uh, Pittsburgh. I think counts, even though it kind of starts there. Yeah, I'd say. Wheeling, Wheeling West Virginia. Wheeling, West Virginia. Yeah. Uh, Owensboro is on the Ohio oh, right. Owensboro is, right. Evan, uh, Evansville. Evansville. Mm-hmm. So a lot of big towns. Um, and doesn't the Ohio get to St. Louis? Doesn't it make it there or no? I think Does it's it split. reach the Mississippi? It, 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 it become, the two become, uh, I think that they join together. But not in St. Louis, right? It I, keeps going it's, down it's Cairo? to Paducah. Cairo. Yeah, Cairo. it's past Paducah, just past Paducah. Okay, very good. Very good. Um, it's a long stretch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, a lot of big towns. And uh, geographically, if you look, I mean, Louisville's not the center, but man, I, I really think it's the heart of the Ohio River. Yeah. So, um, you know, the river is the widest here. I, I always said that when I first moved here, I would cross the bridge. And I'm like, man, these bridges are like a lot wider. That that second street bridge, yeah. Uh, you talk about another terrifying bridge. Yes, like, that one's like <laughs> it's not scary because like I don't know you you perceive any sense of real danger. It just keeps going and going it is a and long going. Yeah, bridge. even the walking bridge. Yeah, I don't think any of the bridges in uh, Cincinnati are nearly as long as the ones in Louisville. And it's also here in Louisville is also the deepest part of the river. And uh, what one little uh, fast fact about Louisville that I, I don't think a lot of people know, it, I certainly didn't, is, you know, as, as a metro area or, or, you know, an extended area, it's not the largest. But as just a regular city, the city of Louisville itself is the largest city on the Ohio. Wow. With I, th- I think that, like, you know, as an area, if you clu- include all the other little towns and stuff, Pittsburgh is like the largest, but um, that's including a lot of other things, not just Pittsburgh itself. And then Cincinnati, um, as a city, just the city itself, is second. So it's actually, you know, you go to Louisville, that, or I'm sorry, you go to Pittsburgh, that seems like a much larger town. Cincinnati, even larger. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but really, I think it goes uh, Louisville, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh. 
in terms of city. So That's cool. It is the largest city on the Ohio River. And uh, I think at, at that with that idea, um, with the reflection of the river, I think it it's, seems to be a perfect place to really sit with that, you know, and, and encourage anyone to just spend time at the river. And if you're in Louisville, which is most of our audience, I'd yeah. say, I mean, this is meant to be a local podcast to reach everyone uh, in our own city, our archdiocese, and um, to just spend time there reflecting and praying and letting God speak to you in that. And uh, I think with that, uh, we'll jump into our next segment after uh, these uh, message or this message from our own uh, uh, time with Spirit and Spire. So we'll see you in a bit. Family Renewal Project is our local Theology of the Body apostolate in service to the Archdiocese of Louisville. They are having a crash course on Theology of the Body on February 3rd and 4th at St. Margaret Mary Catholic Church. This is an incredible opportunity to begin exploring God's master plan for each one of us. Theology of the Body is indeed the answer that we have so desperately needed to this current culture of chaos and confusion. To learn more or to register, go to bit.ly slash tob1-cc-0223, or to see the calendar, go to familyrenewalproject.com slash events. Welcome back, everyone, to Spirit Inspire. We've been talking a little bit about the history of our archdiocese, of our city of Louisville, and uh, to kind of get into that, we've had uh, our good co-host, Eric Huff, with us today. And um, one thing I was reflecting from our last segment, just this kind of, I used an old word in between breaks of tarrying with the history, the meaning, meaning spending time, you know, to, not trying to rush through it, not just trying to focus on dates and numbers and, and all the things we kind of got bored to tears with in school. Yeah. If you remember, like, right. you'd remember all these dates and names and then you had no application to your actual life. So you forgot as soon as you took a test on it. And, right? they, and then you were given technology that made it so you could look up those dates at any <laughs> given time. And you're like, why, why do I need to know this? Right. Yeah. It, right. So on some level, we, we lost that sense of story because it got in the mush of all these details, it didn't really matter compared to the message and the lesson that people learn from these different events within our history. And so like, I think of it like there's two sides, two ways of looking at history. You can either look at it as a, a, as a terrible time of darkness and, and sadness and despair. And to me, I always associate just focusing on names and dates and, and just, seemingly irrelevant things but then there's this focus on the complicated the complex but also the good and the beautiful and the yeah. true that are associated yeah. with the, the complexity because what you're looking for is not just a bunch of negativity or darkness you're right. looking for opportunities for redemption and a, a great illustration of this to me is when they were actually painting the second street bridge yeah if you remember that i do and when they first started it, I remembered it. It was old and gray and rusted and looked kind of ugly. And that was obviously why they needed to do it. But they started painting it on uh, the Louisville side, I believe. Um, and, if, if, and if not, regardless of which side they started painting it, I remember driving. Yeah, no, no, no. They started painting on the Indiana side. And so when you were leaving Louisville... You heard it here first, folks. They started painting it on the Indiana side. Right. So when you would leave Louisville, you seemed to enter into happiness, right? But yeah. But when you were coming back, you were on the, you know, the yellow happy bridge, and then all of a sudden it was dark and sad and depressing as you entered Louisville. And it was like, gosh, is this how we should see our city? But I thought of it more as it went on and on, as... They started on the Indiana side because it was almost like a journey to Louisville to bring redemption and hope and healing to Louisville. So you could look at it as one side or the other, but now it's finished. And there was this movement from Indiana to Louisville. So it's like hope was coming to Louisville. Yeah, they uh, not from Indiana though. The, <laughs> no. the painter, the contractors on the on the on the bridge got the contract because they explained that theodrama. Right, right. That's city. exactly it's, why that's they why paint, they got the opportunity to paint the bridge. The, right? uh, <laughs> the mayor was in tears. Yeah, they're right. like, "Wow, you got you guys have to paint this bridge now." 
That's awesome though. Um, anyway. But yeah, that that's awesome. Great reflection. So we've talked about the river. We've talked about the bridges. Yep. What we haven't talked about a lot are people um, and who lived here, who was involved. Um, whenever I read the histories, you know, they go about back about a thousand BC in this area. However, I had heard um, of of people finding artifacts in the river, um, divers. I have a friend who who actually has dove to the bottom of the Ohio. I don't know if I mentioned wow. it, but um, I mean, even the deepest portion is here in Louisville. It's the deepest and widest portions are, are here somewhere. Um, probably not one in the same, but around sure. around Louisville. And uh, he had dove to some the bottom of the river somewhere. Maybe not the deepest part, I don't think. But uh, and had found a, an arrowhead that was this long. It was for like ceremonial worship that wow. like a chieftain would wear. And and it was a lot earlier than a thousand BC. I can't give an exact date, but um, but yeah, he was telling me about that. And it so there had been people here uh, for a very very long time. Um, but uh, you know, once once settlers, once explorers from Europe came, uh, it it really wasn't a place where a lot of people lived. Um, this was the frontier of Shawnee hunting territory. So they would come out here every now and then. There was no permanent uh, structures or settlement here. They would come out here um, just simply to hunt. And uh, and during this time, you know, they the the Shawnee were were mostly up uh, near Chillicothe, Ohio. That's where they were, Chillicothe, Ohio. And they had a chief, Chief Cornstalk. I love these names. Yeah, it's a great name. Great name. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, and and at this time, um, so. Louisville, or where it is now, we, this is Jefferson County, right? Right. Uh, so here in Jefferson County, uh, named after Tommy J, I think, right? Uh, <laughs> right. But uh, where where did you grow up? Here in Jefferson County? I was born in Jefferson County. Okay. And so I grew up just south of the Jefferson County line in unincorporated Bullitt County. Bullitt County. But I grew up driving past... Oh, over the border between Jefferson and Bullitt County my whole life. So I went to Okalona Little League for baseball, okay. which is right across from Southern High School, Southern Jefferson County. So that whole area has been my stomping grounds my entire life. Um, okay. It's pretty cool. So um, do you know who Bullitt County is named after? If, I um, don't actually. Jefferson County is named after Tommy J. Probably a guy Thomas named Bullitt, Jefferson, right? yeah. <laughs> Tommy B. Tommy B. Tommy B. Thomas, Thomas Bullitt. Bullitt. So you got Tommy J and Tommy B. So, um, yeah, so Thomas Bullitt, um, he didn't found our city, but he wanted to. Hmm. Um, so, you know, George Washington said he was like, said that, that Thomas Bullitt was like the best surveyor in the world. Uh, this is starting to sound like, uh, have you ever seen Drunk History? Yes. <laughs> I, I promise it's just water in these mugs. But, yeah, uh, I remember that. Oh, my gosh. That thing, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, so Tommy B., um, saw this area and uh, at the time you know the revolutionary war um he saw how how um attractive this part of the river was it's very strategic that uh, you know you can't pass through here very easily because of the falls of ohio right so you can regulate who's going up and down the ohio river right here from louisville kentucky um so he noticed that and and also it's great land to be near this to be near the 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 river, there's great farmland around here. Um, so there was a lot of benefits to it. He could see the attractiveness of the land. So rather than just coming down here and taking it, um, he knew that the Shawnee used this land, uh, even though it was in the far reaches of uh, what would technically be considered their territory. Um, he knew that that they still use this to hunt. Right and. He didn't really want to start any problems with the Shawnee. So he traveled up to Chillicothe, Ohio, and, uh, and, and spoke with Chief Cornstalk. But how he did it is absolutely amazing. So like, he didn't send a messenger out like they usually would, like someone ahead to tell them that they're coming. He didn't go in with a big army to keep him safe. Right. He left his men and just walked up there by himself to the Indian Territory, the stronghold of uh, of their territory. And for anyone else's perception, that was a, a death march. You're going, oh yeah, yeah. there's no hope there. Sha Shawnee are, are, are very tough. So, right. uh, 
he he goes up there and, and you know there's tensions all this time between the european settlers obviously and the native americans right uh but but he he has like a, a white handkerchief and they see him and they're like what is this guy doing <laughs> and uh he goes and talks to them about what he wants to do i mean uh he he says hey you get no this is way out you could still hunt here and they're still like in shock that he's even there. Like, who is this guy by himself <laughs> sitting here talking to us? And uh, where did he come from? <laughs> yeah, and this is pretty early days of of their interaction. Now, this is Thomas Bullet. Bullet, right? Bullet, yeah. This is cool, Tommy B. And uh, and I mean, he's like cutting jokes with them and everything. Um, so they're like, uh, I forget. Like, they're asking him questions about well, should. They're like, why did you come here by yourself? Uh, why didn't you wait for your your men and all this stuff? And and he's making jokes about it, like uh, certain things, like um, you know, if you killed a deer, would you wait to tell all your men before you ate it? And all all and they're like, is this a trap? Like, right, and they're well, laughing at good. like they're they're hysterically laughing at his jokes. Like he gets them, he gets their sense of humor. And it's their custom to wait like 24 hours before they make any decision. So he just kind of hangs out with them for the 24 hours. Uh, and um, they come back to him with a decision and they're like, they like even tell him like, man, we had a great time last night hanging out with you. Like those jokes were super funny. We're still skeptical. Like why did this guy wander, <laughs> right. wander into our civilization here? And uh and um, ask for this piece of land, but they're like, you're right. We don't use that for anything but hunting. And, you know, we need this hu the hunting for sustenance to provide for our women and children. Um, but you can have that land right there, that, that, that w the land that would be Louisville, Kentucky. So they, they, they give it to him. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, uh, for whatever reason, I think he dies in his home at the age of 48, pretty young. Oh, wow. But Bullet never makes it down here to Louisville to found the city. So he's not the founder of our city. He's the almost founder of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and, and in the meantime, wow. between that period is, you know, the Revolutionary War happens. I mean, the country's really founded, yeah. the United States. Um, there's a great. There's another bat. There's another war before the Revolutionary War, and I think Chief Cornstalk uh, gets implicated in that. The Shawnee go into war, and then uh, you know the relationship with the settlers and the Native Americans. But you also have the British involved that yeah. aren't right. uh, U.S. United States. Uh, the people who live here, mm -hmm. Americans. So um, there's all these different parties involved. I think uh, Chief Cornstalk gets murdered. So like, it's not like he dies in a battle or something, but like a mob, he gets um, taken prisoner and a mob kills him. So, um, and, and, and like I mentioned before, um, um, Thomas General Bullet, he uh, he dies as well. Right. So it looks like all, all hope is kind of lost on um, settling Louisville, Kentucky. It doesn't come up yet. Um, so we have, uh, do you know who the founder of our city actually ended up being? I, I don't actually. This All is, right. I mean, you're teaching me a lot, Eric. Okay. It's kind of cool. All right. <laughs> and just so you know, the way you tell the story, this history, to me is compelling. And it's like almost, not quite, but it's like watching a movie. Or as you said, it can be a, you could put animated things, but you don't want to get too close to drunk history, drunk history. in that way. I, I, it's if, great. If we could have Jack Black come and uh, <laughs> act it out like he did on Drunk History, yes. I would be all for that, though. Uh, he, could, he could play uh, he could play General Bullet pretty oh, well, yeah, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so anyways, um, our actual founder wasn't a Tommy. Um, mm -hmm. like you would think, um, it was George Rogers Clark. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's so, right. I should have known that. And, uh, there's a great book on him called, uh, the long knife or the long knives. Um, and that was the name for the Virginians. Um, and I don't know where it got started. I, I feel like I've read in different places that that was a name that the Dutch called them that were here. The, a bunch of different, um, native tribes referred to them as, um, but, I think that George Washington 
hmm. might be of that ilk, born in Virginia. Yeah. Um, definitely Bullet was a long knife. Um, and, and definitely George Rogers Clark was another uh, famous long knife. And I think after the Revolutionary War, that came to be a term that was synonymous with Americans too, that they were long knives. Long knives. Yeah, yeah. the long knives. So, um, so another long knife comes along, George Rogers Clark. I actually live in an area where his family, my neighborhood is where his family lived. Hmm. And there's a tree, and I don't know how true this is. This might be getting into pseudo history sure. and mythology, but it's pretty cool that Louisville has mythology too. <laughs> Just like we don't think that Romulus and Remus might not have actually have founded Rome. Um, and just like, you know, um, there, there's myths and legends around every city. Here in Louisville, there's a tree, and man, is it cool and old. And the George Rogers Clark Park, go figure, it's named after the yeah. man. It's in my neighborhood. And there's this giant tree, and it looks old. And it looks like something out of a movie. Like, you could see this tree in Lord of the Rings. Wow. Reminds me of what I think St. Boniface, uh, like a tree St. Boniface cut oh, down yeah. or something. So, um just this epic tree in this little creek valley. And uh, they said like George Rogers Clark threw like a horseshoe in the ground and this tree sprouted up. And there's like some kind of myth to the tree. And his family, some of his family is buried in an old cemetery uh, in the George Rogers Clark Park as well, still to this wow. day. And ought to have been there. You know, I, I, my wife and I, before we were married, went uh, snow sledding one yes. night right there there's yeah. a really awesome hill it's my the best gosh. hill in town it really is and it's man so good. and it was probably like one or two in the morning so there was nobody around yeah we just went and gosh it is awesome and i i, I didn't even think about it till you said that's the name of the park my my wife and i uh after we got married like not to the first winter that we were together uh that we were married um we went and walked down uh with our sleds and, and I mean, we went up and down that hill until like, I couldn't breathe anymore. Yes, yes, like I was just is. like, I have to go home or I'm we gonna die go out here. Right. Like, yeah, oh my God. it's just, there's something really special. It's not a, not a large park, yeah. but it's really beautiful. It is. Um, they've really preserved the natural beauty there too. Um, so George Rogers Clark founded the city. The name of the city, Louisville, um, comes from King, King Louis. Louis, which one? Yeah, that's right. The 16th. The 16th. So it's important to know. So why is it named after King Louis? I don't know. These are these are Protestants that founded it. They're um, Revolutionary War heroes. They're not Catholic at all, hmm. but it's named after the Catholic King of France. That's so significant. It's super interesting. Yeah. And not just the Catholic King of France, but the last. Catholic King of France. The reason being is that um, during the Revolutionary War, I told you, I think Chief Cornstalk might have been on the side of the British, might have been back and forth, but um, so picking sides was really important at that time. Right. And, uh, and, and King Louis chose to pick the side of the Revolutionary Army and he helped to fund um, some of their campaigns. So in honor of him and his support. During the Revolutionary War. Yeah. So was he the one who ended up sending the ships eventually that would then help them defeat Cornwallis at Yorktown? I don't know. I don't know. That would be crazy. But yeah. I, I don't know. We'll have to look into it. Yeah. We'll have to look into That's it. That's good. Wow. So, uh, so yeah. So they, they named the city in his honor. So um, a city in at this time to be named after, not like it's the Revolutionary War. We didn't, you know. Washington didn't want to become a king. He right. he he was he idolized Cincinnati, um, of of my city's namesake. Oh wow! Yeah, um, we could get into that too. I guess we talked enough about Rome, but uh, <laughs> to be named after a king is uh, is very odd, and a Catholic king at that, and uh, yeah, and a French Catholic king, the last king of France. Yeah. Um, so wait, he wasn't just the last Catholic king of France. He was the last king of, of France. France. Yeah, up until the present. Wow, I did not realize the French that. Revolution. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. There's so much to this story that that makes me like, kind of get chills because I think of, like, the Israelites looking for, um, 
their purpose. You know, they, they, they entered the promised land according to God's promise. They're settling. And yet the more, the further and further the tribes live away from Shiloh, which at that time was a central place of worship before Jerusalem, yeah. the further away they got, the more they would fall into the habits and, and religious practices of these pagan nations that they didn't fully conquer in the yeah. promised land. And that was the period of the judges. So you had all the way to Samuel and, you know, every judge, they started out well, but as time went on, they just got worse. And Who's worse your favorite worse. judge? Oh gosh, I can't remember all the names, but, uh, I mean, Samson's pretty famous, so I've always grown up knowing that story. He's a great judge, yeah. He's, he's the last one, of, right? Yeah, he's the last one. It was just kind of a tragic story because yeah. he was, as I've heard Jeff Caven say, he's more of an anti-hero than an actual hero. But he was the last judge that would then usher in uh, the kind of the last judge, first prophet, which was Samuel. And Samuel would start the whole process of Israel wanting a king. Yeah. And Israel had basically fallen away from the original uh, understanding of the, the tent of meeting that was established with Moses and the, and the temple of worship, that they literally forgot that God himself was their king. The invisible king was still a king that delivered them from all the slavery of Egypt and the wilderness and, and gave them the ability to conquer the promised land to begin with. But... Even then, they asked specifically, even though Samuel warned them, like, look, if you get a king the way you're talking, he's just going to end up being a dictator and take everything away from you. And they still insisted, no, we want a king like all the other nations. And sure enough, they got King Saul, who had major problems. Yeah. They had a great golden age with King David and King Solomon, but all the other kings pretty much were no better than any other king of any other government throughout history. So I think, sadly, a lot of people get this mentality of a king is a tyrant by sure. definition. When the king of kings that we're kind of alluding to here, maybe in the, yeah. the symbolism of the Catholic king of France being the, the, the name that the city is named after, we're not. I'm not so much worried about the king of France. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of beauty and goodness from that, that reality sure. um, and who he was. But who he then represents, because even the king of Israel that Samuel said, he never named Saul the king. He named him a prince. And he named him an equal to the people who would then represent the people and represent God to the people. And so in the same way, any king should be focused on their people serving their people, any president, any person in power should do that. Yeah. But um, I don't know. To this me, is, this is going to tie back in. I know. This is exactly where I'm going with oh, this. So you're awesome. reading it. I love it. Um, do you think we could take a quick break? Yeah, let's, let's take a break and uh, we'll be back to kind of get into the depth of this, uh, this city of Louisville and the reality of what God is doing as he unearths, as he reveals this kingdom that we've been living in our whole lives. We'll see you soon on Spirit Inspired after this. Hey everyone, another sponsor for today's episode is the Cathedral of the Assumption in the heart of downtown Louisville, Kentucky. It is the spiritual center of parish and family life and is a historic treasure for the Catholic Church in America. Take a tour or consider visiting for mass. Check them out at cathedraloftheassumption.org. Welcome back to Spirit Inspire, everyone. We've been talking about the history of the Archdiocese of Louisville, uh, starting with the city of Louisville and all that led up to its founding. And it's been pretty compelling stuff so far. I'm with Eric uh, Huff, my good co-host. I'm John Soule, if you don't remember. And um, Oh, I, I remember, John. I figured you would. I remember. Um, but I, it says your name on the cup, too. Oh, yeah, you can't forget our names, right? Um, but um, speaking of remembering, I... I it's lessons from our story that I think is, is powerful. And some things we've never even heard. Like I've been learning a lot from you, Eric, this story of how our city was founded. Other things I've heard growing up and never really connected to or, or really made sense of um, because I was like, well, it's just a fact I need to know. Like George Rogers Clark founded the city, but how does he fit in to the story? Or, or I knew Louisville was named after one of the kings of France, but I never knew 
who that king was and how that mattered. So, I mean, I don't know. Tell me more about Louisville and everything that happened to make sure. this happen. I kind of want to cut back. I think uh, yeah, sure. you're, you're going to get me off on a tangent by something you mentioned uh, in the last segment. Tangents aren't always a yeah, bad thing. Which, uh, which had to do with, um, with you know, a good leader or a good king. And, and like you said, you know, Christ is, and you were talking about the book of Judges and how they wanted a temporal king on earth. Um, but God already reigned over them in heaven. Uh, and, and it just made me reflect on, you know, the judges were, were a little rough uh, in terms of their, their leadership. And, uh, and like you said, the first king of, of Israel was, uh, was a little rough himself. Um, but there have been, you know, good leaders or great leaders in history. And, and we're talking about the namesake of Louisville. I did want to get into the namesake of my own hometown on the Ohio River, Cincinnati. Um, Maybe as an aside, um, just because I'm so proud of oh, it. Oh, of course. Do it. Do it. All right. That's so uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, is named after a dictator. Not a king, a dictator. Um, so, wow. you know, you were, you were talking about, and you definitely use dictator in the negative, and rightfully so. Um, you know, there's been probably thousands of dictators uh, over the course of history, yep. and uh, none of them have been good, except for maybe one. So Cincinnati uh, and the city of Cincinnati is going to be, I, I don't know if it's in the nominative plural or the genitive singular, which would make it mean one of two things, which would either be um, a city of Cincinnati, like his city, uh, if it's in the genitive singular, or Cincinnati as in the plural, as in like everyone who lives in Cincinnati, Cincinnati is a little Cincinnati. Uh, they come from him. But he was, like I said, he was uh, in the Roman Republic maybe four or 500 years before the birth of our Lord. Wow. Um, yeah, so he was a consul in the Roman uh, Senate, and uh, he, was a, he, he relinquished power three times in his life. So as consul, I believe he was a patrician, and uh, the plebeians, which are like, um, you know, they're kind of the, the the representatives of the people, whereas the patricians were like the the more upscale um, members of society. They allowed the plebeians to also have their own representation in the Senate. And during this time, um, the plebeians, for whatever reason I can't remember, uh, felt like they needed to keep their consuls in in office longer, and uh, than than the typical term. I think it might have been uh, a year. And it uh, could have been four. I, I'm not sure. But um, they felt like they had to keep it longer. And uh, Cincinnati took over as a consul after um, maybe one of the plebeians had, uh, had done this. Yeah. And uh, when he took over, he chose to only stay his term. So he could have said, hey, the patricians also want to uh, extend our term limits. But he didn't. He said, nope, this is a term, and I'm going to step down will willfully. Um, and, and it was really important. Like, at that time, I'm pretty sure, like, whoever, like, the year was named after whoever it was that was uh, was serving their term. So, like, he was serving, finishing the term for someone else, so he didn't even get a year named after him. Like, a lot of humility there. Yeah. Uh, I think his son got him into a lot of problems. He lost a lot of his wealth. But he was he lived across the Tiber, across the river, and uh, he would plow his field, and he had kind of stepped away from it all. And uh, there was a period of uh, great distress in Rome. Uh, I, I forget which. Uh, I mean, I think it's the Aquines. Uh, somebody, somebody who knows uh, classical history can uh, can probably correct me on my pronunciation, or if oh, that, sure. that's who it was or not. But they had basically had gone to battle with uh, with Rome, and they had, in this valley, surrounded um, the, the Roman army, the entire army of Rome. And uh, at that time, you know, Rome's in big trouble. So they needed help, they needed a leader who could save them. So they could do something where they could announce a dictator, which was, isn't too far, in my estimation, off from what we think of a dictator. They have absolute power. Right. The Senate gives them absolute power, for uh, a certain amount of time. And so they elected Cincinnati dictator of all of Rome. So they go out to his farm across the river and he's out there plowing the field. 
and he leaves behind his plow to go be the dictator of Rome. Um, I'm not sure how begrudgingly. So that was his title? Dictator? Dictator. <laughs> they made him the Roman like, dictator. You make that your title. That's terrible. Well, he didn't make it his title. Oh, they, right. they, they, they put they, it on him. They elected him as dictator. Mm. Uh, and, and maybe in history at this point, it doesn't have the connotations it does have now. Uh, that's very they true. They probably had a lot of bad dictators after that. So this is the one that I can think of who's the good dictator. And so Cincinnati, um, he, he goes and he shuts everything down in Rome. You're not allowed to go out to eat. You're not allowed to go shopping. If you're a fighting age, you're, um, you're, you're drafted. And so he builds up kind of this army. If you're not of fighting age, if you're too old, then uh, you're going to help us carry stuff uh, and build stuff. So they go over and they surround the army that's surrounding the Roman army. So now that army's in a worse spot <laughs> because... Uh, they're surrounded on both sides at yeah. that point, right? Yeah, yeah. So they're, wow. they're in real big trouble. And so he has this tremendous victory. He's marched through the, the streets. People are screaming his name like Cincinnati. And he's like a total hero. And he was also merciful um, and, and didn't make the opposing army. He didn't put them all to death. Uh, he brought them back to Rome and made them do this thing called uh, passing under the yoke. You ever heard this? Mm -mm. When, they, when they pass under the yoke, it's just like a, uh, it just disgraces them. Like they do not want to pass under the yoke. But like it's merciful because he's not killing you. But yeah. they pass under the yoke and everybody's like, you stink. <laughs> and uh, so they pass under the yoke. And Cincinnati is given, you know, Cincinnati is given that laurel wreath. And uh, he probably could have remained the dictator. Yeah. Uh, but he steps down. Wow. So he chooses of his own will to go back to his farm. When do you ever hear that? You don't. In fact, uh, people thought it was a, just a legend. Like, people didn't think it was real history, not because it wasn't well attested to, but maybe some of that as well, but because from the time of Cincinnati, it didn't happen again. And in fact, Cincinnati did it twice. There was some other uprising in Rome, and they made him dictator again, and he stepped down again. So there's three times in his life, really, where he's relinquished his power humbly uh, and, and lives in, a, in, in humility, and he wanted to get back to his wife and, and all of that. So, um, and his farm. That's so significant. People didn't think that this was a true story until it happened again. There's only been one other time in history where somebody's been given this kind of power and they relinquished it. Uh, I can't tell you. It's not, you're not getting to King Louis. No, oh, okay. no, no, no. So uh, we're talking about King Louis and we're talking about, you know, the significance of after the Revolutionary War to name a city after. Oh, you're talking about George Washington. George Washington. Oh my gosh. I was going to say that so Cincinnati he, reminds me of George Washington. Well, yeah. That's the only other time. So yeah, it didn't happen in the in the interim. And I'm talking like since Cincinnati is like three to 500 years before before Christ. That's amazing. Um, so, um, what hope does that give for yeah. our own country? Right, own, right. Wow. So it's almost like a two thousand year difference, <laughs> uh, I think, between uh, Washington and Cincinnati. But he really, Washington knew about Cincinnati in this story. Yeah, I think that's significant too. And also, Washington wanted to go back to Mount Vernon, his farm, but uh, Washington. Um, had the Revolutionary Army, I think, for like a year after the Revolution. So he could have done anything. Yeah, he really... Like, nobody knew until the day that Washington rolls back into town with the army and hands it over to Congress if he's going to remain the king, if he's going to remain the dictator. And like Cincinnati, like, um, he was popular. In fact, they asked him to be king, or yeah. some did. And, right? and he chose the term limit, like Cincinnati did early on. So, uh, super important right. that now, connection. Now he didn't set to the set the law at where presidents were only allowed to be uh, president for two terms because that happened after FDR. Sure. FDR because FDR had more than two terms, and that's when they actually passed the law that presidents can't. Right. But as far as I understand, because of what George Washington did, yeah, that set an example, a precedent. Literally, a precedent for the president 
for a hundred years, yeah, a hundred and fifty years almost before anyone would ever breach that on some level. And that took literally the Great Depression and World War II for a president to do so. And now they've simply made sure the president couldn't do so. Right. But to me, that gives me that gives me hope that that's part of our founding, and that. I never knew that about Cincinnati. Yeah. And and you can you can choose virtue. Yes, you can choose it. Yeah. You and don't it's not just absolute power. Like I always grew up hearing the phrase absolute power corrupts absolutely. And 9.9 .9 times out of 10 that, that is, is true. that is the case. But yeah. think about the one who does actually have absolute power and that's God himself, right. Jesus Christ, right. and he was not corrupted by the enemy. And he gave us the power through the Holy Spirit and and certain examples within history of people who were able uh, in some supernatural capacity obviously to choose virtue, to choose humility, to choose to step down from any of that power. That's that's incredible. Right. And I mean it just shows too there's a lot of humility in both Cincinnatus uh George Washington um it shows like too that 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 choosing humility, that choosing God's grace, um, you know, I, I think every day we have that choice. Are we going to choose what we want from our lives? The selfishness, the self-centeredness, to be cold-hearted to others, to not show others charity and mercy, um, to to do things to bolster our own egos, to bolster our own pride, or do we choose to humble ourselves? Do we choose to um, you know be merciful? just as God is merciful to us. Like he's an almighty king. Like when Christ went to the cross uh, as a king, as a greater king, as a greater leader uh, than, than any king, dictator, or president ever, ever uh, he went very humbly. And he, he has like the ability uh, as they're taking him to the cross, like he can make everyone in the world, everyone who is spitting on him, whipping him, beating him, making him carry a cross, mocking him to his face uh, in front of his own mother and f his followers who abandoned him, uh, him going to die at a young age. He has the absolutely could just like wipe them all out of history instantly. Yeah, he could have brought, made them cease to exist and to have ever existed. Yeah, yet... a not pure annihilation. Yes. And, and cho chose to humbly die on the cross even for those who were present uh, uh, to him. So also showing the ultimate humility uh, isn't just, you know, bringing back an army, but if, if you think of the power that our Lord has, um, that, that both the story of Cincinnati and the story of George Washington are really amazing compared to any other leaders in the history of the world. Um, but they're they're not very amazing <laughs> when you compare them of to what not. our Lord has done. Of course, like it's so it's so profound. Um, mm. So, as any leader, and, and I think we'll get to this in the next segment when we start to talk about the namesake of our city. Right. Um, any leader, they can do well temporarily. You could be, you know, a bad dictator. You always hear all the time about like what some terrible leader. Well, he did a couple of good things too. <laughs> you, you know, there's some good in the worst of us, right? And there's some bad in the best of us. But uh, even if you're good or bad, or so, uh, we're all somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um, there's a difference, especially if you have some power. If you humble yourself, uh, and I would challenge any leader. We have a new mayor here in town. Um, the president of the United States, whoever, any leader, like if you humble yourself to do God's will, to do what he's asking of you, no matter what your state in life, like that's always going to end out a thousand times better than, than what you could white knuckle and just, you know, uh, get done yourself. Yes. Even, even if as a leader you make mistakes or you have policies and beliefs that aren't fully in line, God can use, and not to not to enable or say that things like that are good or, or worth holding on to if they're not in line with God, but right. he can even use those things to steer things the right way somehow. And it's, it's a mystery, but, you know, I think of 
Um, my wife and I got to go to Israel a couple of years ago and with Christopher West, and he was sharing the story of a student of his who asked him one time, Christopher, why did Jesus Christ choose that particular time in history, that particular political climate, that country, that geographic location? Why at that time? He could have come 2,000 years later with social media. People could have had posted, posted on Twitter, Instagram. I mean, they could have had absolute proof of him and doing everything he did. Why did he choose then? And Christopher didn't have an answer for him. And so the guy went back to his studies. He took it to prayer. And he came back and said, I have the answer. I know. It's not what you think. Jesus Christ chose that particular time in history. It seems to me the most likely reason for no other political gain or way of proving his existence other than to save the good thief. Yeah. And it's that kind of love, that self-emptying of our leaders that... I think gives us hope uh, for the possibility of paradise. You know, we have a lot of political leaders, people in power that think they can build utopia on earth, build the kingdom of God. But what you end up doing is building a tower of Babel where no one understands each other. Everyone's disconnected and everyone feels lost, confused and afraid. And I feel like on some level, that's what this stuff has the power to do, to disconnect us. Yeah. And if we learn how to use things like this responsibly and our leaders learn how to do so uh, and truly focus on the individual person and not just the agenda that that person may be a, connected to or you're using them for, whatever it is, sure. I feel like we would have a better glimpse of the eternal heaven we're all seeking, that we're all searching for. Yeah. You know? Thank God for George Washington and Cincinnatus. I didn't even know that story. And and um, pretty righteous pagan, yeah. Yeah, it get, right. It gives me hope that we can find redemption in our own city, in yeah. our own government, absolutely, you know, in absolutely. our own church. <laughs> so. It's awesome. All right. All right. Well, with that, we'll uh, we'll take a pause here for uh, this segment, and we'll be back with more Spirit Inspire after this. Hey, everyone! Here at Spirit Inspire, we want to serve our community by highlighting God's work in our parishes, schools, and apostolates. We hope to bring renewal and unity between all those in the body of Christ. If you would like a shout out in the next episode of Spirit Inspire, go to spiritinspire.com or email us at spiritinspire at gmail.com. Thanks and God bless. Welcome back to Spirit Inspire, everyone. I'm your host, John Soule. This is our last and final segment on our uh, dive into the story of the Archdiocese of Louisville. The city of Louisville is where we're starting. And uh, we've done a lot of groundwork right now with my good friend and co-host, Eric Huff. He's been telling a pretty compelling story. I love this guy, how he shares history and makes it fun and interesting. Without a bunch of dates and names, we're kind of focused on more of the message, the lessons, the, the people that lived these lives, uh, that they were human. You know, they, they face similar situations that we're facing today, politically, spiritually, uh, practically with their own families. And uh, I just think it's amazing that we've, uh, that we've been able to, to dive into this story in a way that unearthed, unearthed some treasures that perhaps have been lost in the minds and hearts of so many people in Louisville and in our own United States. And uh, for me, I've never heard the story of how Louisville was founded and how that, uh, how that matters, right? Sure. I mean, so often we think of history as stuff that just happens and none of it's connected and none of it matters. Uh, because how does it apply to me? How does it make a difference in my life? And I think that's what it means to, you know, for me, my favorite phrase, because I work for Family Renewal Project, is discover your story, yeah. right? So that's part of that. You know, it's powerful. So what else you got for and, us? And, Eric? you know, God has a, has, a, has a story in store for all of us, both individually. Right. But, you know, as a country. Yes. As the world at this, at this snapshot in human history uh, and as a city. Uh, and we were talking about the city of Louisville, which I guess was, was the main point of this discussion before I derailed it to talk about Cincinnati, yeah. which will happen often. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, when yeah. you grow up in Cincinnati, yeah. that's your point just of reference. A, just a sense. proud patriot of the city of, of Cincinnati. Another one, you know, it might be founded on, on some blood, but uh, right. as, every, as every man-made city is. 
Um, I do like Cincinnati has that uh, that Latin name, but um, also there's a Latin name for Louisville. Really, Ludovico Politana, I think. Ooh, yeah. what's it mean? Oh wait, Louisville. It means Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, I love that you you talk about Cincinnati. Loosely translated. Yeah, of course. Louisville. I, uh, right, Louisville, Louisville, Loveville. I don't know. There's lots of Louisville. 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 Uh, anyway, um, and uh, I do want to point out we we do pronounce it what Louisville, Louisville, Louisville. Yeah. Like you got like you got marbles in your mouth. Is Louisville. some way I've Louisville. heard it. Louisville, right, right. Um, but uh, it's not named after King Lul, as we spoke about earlier. <laughs> uh, I've right. never heard of uh, King Lul. <laughs> well, no, it of uh, France. Of France. Um, oh my gosh! It's uh, <laughs> King, King Louis. Um, and there's a lot of other Lewises in uh, yes. in in some of our naming in in America. Um, yeah, St. Louis. And St. Then, Louis. Uh, there's other uh, Louisiana. Louisiana. Right? So Louisville, like we said, is the 16th King Louis the 16th, the last King of France. Louisiana. Uh, you historians out there can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, is the Sun King? That's. Uh, the great king, uh, his grand Louis the Sixteenth grandfather Louis the Fourteenth, right? Uh, an earlier one, and then even earlier than that, Saint Louis is named after Saint Louis the Ninth. Oh, okay. Yeah, Louis the Ninth. Um, right, because a lot of people would just think, oh, it's the same one, but no, no, something. they're all three are a different man. Very good. Um, so during, uh, and we talked about the city being named after the Louis the Sixteenth. I do want to kind of bounce back to the 14th, I guess, here at this sure. point to give us some of the background and the history of our namesake of the town um, to kind of wrap up the segment. And, and it does. It really brings together some themes we've already spoke on um, throughout throughout this conversation. Um, one of the things, so Louis the 14th, uh, we talked about in the last segment about humbling yourself and doing God's will. Uh, have you ever heard of St. Margaret Mary? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So St. Margaret Mary, what's she known She's for? She's the Sacred Heart, right? The she sacred had the vision heart of the Sacred Heart. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's some earlier examples, I think, of um, visions of the Sacred Heart even. But she's the first, like, clear-cut um, saint of the Sacred Heart that had She's like 1500, 1600, something like that? Ah, uh, like a little later than that. Yeah, okay. 1600s, 1700s, I Okay, think. gotcha. Um, That's cool. So... She uh, was alive during the reign of the Sun King uh, that Louisiana is named oh, after. Oh, so she was alive during King Louis the Fourteenth. Fourteenth. Oh, okay. Wow. And she went to him and said that uh, he needed to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart. Now, at this time, the French Revolution hadn't happened. Uh, France was the most Catholic country probably in history. Uh, you know, you can trace France back to Charlemagne. Yeah, and uh, I think Joan of Arc, Saint Joan of Arc, even said when she she had a vision of Charlemagne and Saint Louis um, praying for France in heaven, and uh, there's just endless saints uh, in France. They call France the eldest daughter of the Church. Uh, that's where the remains of Saint Anne. Uh, Jesus' own grandmother ended That's up. That's amazing. And uh, we talked about that on a previous episode yeah, yeah. in France. And then the, the country of France itself, like I said, has produced um, numerous, numerous um, saints. Well, my favorite is, of course, St. Bernadette of Lourdes. Right? Yeah. That famous story and the, the healing waters that you can visit even to this day. It was on 60 Minutes last night. Really? They did an episode on Lourdes. I didn't get to see it yet, so... We got to go back and see if it was any good. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so uh, yeah. so France is just a, a Catholic um, a Catholic powerhouse at this point in history. Very Catholic. There's honestly no spiritual or temporal need for him to consecrate anything because it's already consecrated to Christ. The society is Christian. The people are Christian. Um, what need is there? Um, he so. He wants to do it. And I think there's a discernment there that, that they know that this is the right thing to do. And why would they why would they reject it? Right. Like this is supernatural in my own opinion. She said it would be even more Catholic um, and more Christian and more graces would flow if he did it. Um, 
but they're already riding the highest horse. Like, I don't think there's ever been a more Christian um, empire, really, than, than France at this time. Yeah. So all of his advisors, all of them very devout in their faith, or seemingly so, and the king himself, they think that's a high-risk, low-reward scenario. Because she says that you need to do this and it'll make France more Catholic. And if you don't do it, you'll lose it all. But when they're looking at the temporal level, if we do this and then something bad does happen, it'll look like, you know, it'll, it'll diminish the faith. Do you see the risk involved? Wow. So that's... as a ruler, they're juggling it and they think about it that way. And uh, I think. As you'll see, um, that's dangerous that'll, territory. That'll be that'll be a problem, and uh, so they don't consecrate France to the Sacred Heart, and Louis the Fifteenth doesn't do it either. Mm. So we get down to the last one, our city's namesake, uh, Louis the Sixteenth. And do you think he consecrates it? No, he can't have. There's no way. If he's the last king, it would make sense because otherwise, it would have been more. He after. did consecrate it. Wait, he did? Yeah. So. Um, but there's a problem. So it's a little more complex than that. Sure. So the French Revolution happens. The king's overthrown. He hasn't consecrated it to the to the Sacred Heart. Yet. And at that point. At that point. And uh, when he's when he's in, in prison to be executed, uh, he goes, you know what? I'm going to consecrate it to the Sacred Heart. But he no longer has the authority and the power. It's over. So it's a tragedy. He consecrates it to the Sacred Heart from his prison cell, uh, but it's too late. Like that Catholic France is kind of gone, uh, seemingly forever. Yeah. Um, who knows? Uh, there used to be a statue, and and as we know, he was executed. Uh, Marie Antoinette, um, that whole story. Like a lot of the Carmelite nuns that were executed, uh, many in Catholic France um, faced extreme persecution. Obviously, the rise of Napoleon after that. Uh, who is, you know, considered widely, whether it be like the Russians at that time who fought him at Borodino or whatever, um, you know, see him as an antichrist. Uh, he, right. he even, uh, he even captured Napoleon. He even captured uh, two popes, including Pius the Seventh, who was the pope that founded our archdiocese here in Louisville. So, uh, so yeah, so he captured uh, Pius the Seventh. He found, and he also founded the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Now it was the Diocese of Bardstown, right at the time. At that time, and I think the Diocese of Cincinnati. I think they've both been elevated to Archdiocese since, uh, but they weren't at the exact same time. No, no, they were founded over his twenty-year reign as yeah, Roman Pontiff. Gotcha. Um, both of these dioceses uh, were carved out in their own right which I think will be the topic of a future episode. Oh, yeah. And maybe that There's gives no us, way we'll get that to give it a, That gives <laughs> us a good starting off point, an ending point for us now in terms of history, that who uh, was the spiritual leader of our church when our diocese was founded. Uh, and that can really, really help us to understand in what lens to look at our history as the Archdiocese of Louisville. Um, but... I do want to end on the note of... Uh, and that was Pope Pius the seventh, the seventh, who you're referring to. Yeah, yep, servant right. of God. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I do want to leave on the point of, uh, you know, kind of that tragedy of Louis the Sixteenth. Like, our city's named after him. Um, who knows how great this city would have been uh, for a, a, in honor of our namesake, you know, if he had done God's will um, before it was too late, while he still had rule and reign. Uh, or even his father or his grandfather, uh, generationally. So it's never, you know, too late for us to turn towards God, though. Right. Um, and, and as you say that, I think of, uh, I think of death itself being a, a prison of sorts, you know. And, and think of the people before the resurrection of Christ, yeah. you know, who were destined for heaven, but not in hell. Yeah. They were incapable of saving themselves because of post fall before the resurrection there was no 
way that they could be in full union with God until the total redemption. And so when Christ's resurrection comes, it's it's literally like he unlocked the keys to Sheol, which was this place of the the place of the dead, right? Yeah. To then welcome them into the kingdom, you know, right. which establishes what we now know as the communion of saints and all these people in heaven praying for us and Perhaps in his redemption in prison, King Louis the four, uh, the sixteenth might be in that number. Obviously, he's not been canonized. I'm not going to canonize him. Sure, he's not Saint Louis. Right, not at all. But but it it gives me hope because our city is named after him. Now, there's a reason our city is named after him. Somebody made that decision. It had to have come to before a before he he lost his powers. Before he lost his powers. This city was named after yeah. he was alive yeah. when this city was named. Yeah, to my knowledge, I think that's true. See, that to me is incredible. And so there, there had to have been some correspondence connection there. And I think of this... Or, or at least in his honor, yeah. Yeah, at least in his honor, right? And so I, I think of the, the covenantal strand of promise that accompanied the, the, the sons, the, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then all of these people through the lineage that led to the birth of Jesus, right? Including Ruth, um, uh, Rahab, all of these, even the women you know, that they were then grafted into the genealogy of Jesus because of their faithfulness, even though they were Gentiles, even though they weren't even Israelites. Right, right. Yeah, right. it's crazy. Like, I, let, let me uh, let me take a moment to pause so maybe yeah. our listeners don't know um, about that. But, right. but typically, genealogies just follow the male lineage. Right, exactly. But in the genealogy of Jesus, is this in Matthew specifically? It's, well, there are two genealogies that are listed in yeah. the Gospels. One many ascribed to be the genealogy of Joseph. Yeah. And then the other, many ascribed to be the genealogy of Mary. Yeah. And so on some level, we have both genealogies that are well documented. Sure. That could then have led to the birth of Christ. And so, and again, who would then overthrow death itself and give us the hope for redemption? So I think of King Louis the 16th in prison, well after it's too late, you know, doing this consecration. Right. And yeah. I just wanted, I wanted oh, to yeah, focus yeah. on the, the, oh, yeah, yeah. the women. Oh, so, right. Go, so, go, go so, into yeah. that real so, quick. Yeah. Uh, I think it's Matthew, right? Where mm -hmm. the, the genealogies, uh, including them. these women, um, some of them prostitutes. Yep. Um, so some multiple of them. that were abandoned by their husbands. Yeah, and, yeah. Multiple of them. Uh, one of them caught in an adulterous affair. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a real messy situation. Um, no, but but it's already out of the norm for women to be included in the genealogies. But these women who were included, you know, it wasn't like they were uh, exemplary characters. Some of them are one of the at least one of them I can think of is uh, an exemplary character. But they definitely were women of faith in God, and God chose them in His plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and to me that is that's the whole point that that. We can't save ourselves, you know, and you can't just think of things like consecration or um, spiritual practices in the in the world of popular piety to be the antidote to your own salvation or redemption or healing or whatever you're looking for. Right. And that these are, are meant to be manifestations of the human heart. And so the reality of France not finding their their way until it was too late means on some level there was this unhealthy attitude toward fear, this suspicion that was, you know, it was almost like termite damage that you don't see apparently until it's too late and it's already cracked and fallen and it's over. And yet, maybe, and I obviously can't predict anything, but maybe his act of consecration in a desperate state of France may have been lost to France at that time in history. But just maybe God gives us the ability to see that in one day, even if Louisville has struggled for years and many years, that there is hope that both for France and for Louisville and for anyone in, caught up in that story, that we could get out of prison that we could actually break down any walls of spiritual strongholds, of bureaucracy, of miscommunication, of lack of formation, right? So that we could actually 
get a glimpse of the promised land, to, yeah. to see the kingdom of God within our own city of Louisville, within our archdiocese, our parishes, especially our central place of worship, which is the Cathedral of the Assumption, which yeah. has its own history. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's a profound reality to, to spend time with, to pray with, to think about, and to, to ask Jesus for that gift of freedom from any of these things that have held us back for so many years and decades and perhaps centuries at this point. But that's gonna take another episode or more. Or 20. <laughs> or 20, right. Yeah. So, so you got I, any closing thoughts or ideas? I Eric? just think uh, back to, to bring it back to the beginning is, mm -hmm. um, you know, any city that's built by man and any any person, any human person is, is fallible, is right. broken. Um, so, any any city's foundation is is going to be built on the brokenness and humanity of people, um, whether it be that those broken people be Romulus, or uh, Cain, or um, well well George Rogers Clark, <laughs> right right, um, not not Thomas Bullitt, not Thomas Bullitt, almost but not quite. <laughs> Maybe that's why he couldn't do it. Maybe he was too righteous to be uh, the founder of a city. <laughs> right, I don't know. Right. Um, but no matter who the city's built on, uh, on the temporal sense, it's going to be a, a, a human person. Yes. Um, the city that's built on love is a city that's built on the person of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Uh, and, and I think that that's the closing note. That's the, uh, that's the punchline, um, is that uh, without Christ, uh, you can have a great city, but man, you know, it, it's, it could be so much greater yes. if you turn towards God, if you put God first, if you uh, reflect in prayer uh, and bring it to him. No matter how great a leader you are, uh, you need to put Christ first. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, there's nothing greater than him. There's no way that in our brokenness as humans, not just as individuals, but as a collective, um, that we can accomplish half of what we could accomplish with Christ in our lives. Right. If we want to truly leave a legacy, then we need to allow Christ to teach us how to become living stones, witnesses to the resurrection, servant leaders, to where we're not seeking political gain or this long tenure uh, that oftentimes, even in our country, lasts more than many kings and queens of our day but we're rather seeking to become a public servant, a true statesman, stateswoman, right. any and person. Louis, Louis the Fourteenth didn't live to see like the fall of France, right. but he would have never guessed at their height. They were doing much better than they were for the last 10 generations or something, right? Yes. At their height, he would have never guessed that it would fall within two generations. Similarly, within God's providence, I know someone who has uh, you know, a bunch of sons, had like five or six sons. Yeah. And they're, they're you know, um, but you never know what God's going to do. All those sons had all daughters. Um, so you never know. Like, <laughs> even if you have five sons, that could be the end. Nobody else is going to take right. your last name. Right. Not necessarily a bad thing, but, you know, God has other plans. And, and on, obviously he's in control long after you're gone. Mm -hmm. And that if we can trust in him, then anything that we are trying to quote unquote build will actually be lasting because it's built upon the foundation of Christ. And so that, that I think is a, the perfect place to, to end. And we'll pick back up with more of the story of Louisville and the founding at uh, another episode, I think. And Look forward to it. I, I do too. So God bless you all. And it's been a great, great experience sharing this story with you. And we'll continue to share the story in future episodes. In the meantime, uh, click like, subscribe, you know, teach the algorithms to share the gospel and to share this incredible story of salvation, of hope, of healing that we all so desperately need. So God bless you all and we will see you next week.